Are you a hiring manager or recruiter? Could you benefit from a cost-efficient and easy way to train your new staff in cyber? We know that it can be expensive and time-consuming to ramp up new hires. That's why CyberWire Pro is available at a discount to large groups, so that you and your team can get up to speed and stay there. CyberWire Pro brings the most important information in a concise and easily retainable way, all while saving you time. Contact us to get your special group pricing at thecyberwire.com slash contact us. That's thecyberwire.com slash contact us. And now a message from our sponsor, Cyber Reason. Cybersecurity defenders don't fear ransomware, they end it. With Cyber Reason, defenders detect and stop ransomware that even others miss. A promise backed by their $1 million breach warranty. At Cyber Reason, they don't fear ransomware, they end it. Learn more at cyberreason.com. SolarWinds patches a zero day exploited by a Chinese threat group. We got Patch Tuesday notes. What's up with our evil? Takedown, retirement, rebranding, or glitch? Joe Kerrigan from Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute on cell phone carriers sneaking us ads via SMS. Our guest is Nico Van Summeren of Absolute Software with a look at endpoint risk. And those bots like football. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, July 14th, 2021. We begin with a few quick notes on this week's patches. SolarWinds yesterday patched a vulnerability in its ServeU FTP server that Microsoft discovered. Bleeping Computer reports that groups based in China were using the vulnerability to prospect U.S. defense contractors and software companies. The Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center says it has observed DEV-0322 targeting entities in the U.S. defense industrial-based sector and software companies. This activity group is based in China and has been observed using commercial VPN solutions and compromised consumer routers in their attacker infrastructure. Yesterday was Patch Tuesday. Microsoft's fixes included patches for three zero days undergoing exploitation in the wild, two Windows kernel privilege escalation issues, and one scripting engine memory corruption flaw. CISA released advisories on 21 industrial control system products, and a separate CISA emergency directive also required federal agencies to apply mitigations to Windows print spooler vulnerabilities, Those mitigations have been made generally available in Microsoft's July updates, and CISA wants the agencies it oversees to implement them. Our evil's disappearance early yesterday morning from its usual online haunts, including its own cynically named Happy Blog, remains unexplained. The New York Times and others note that the vanishing followed a U.S. request that Russia do something about ransomware gangs operating from its territory— but it's unclear what connection that had with the American demarque. Steve Moore, chief security strategist at security firm Exabeam, wrote to offer some perspective on what may have happened to our evil. Quote, It would seem that everything is down for our evil. Landing page, payment, help desk chat. This outage could be criminal maintenance, planned retirement, or, more likely, the result of an offensive response to the criminal enterprise. We don't know. If the outage is the result of an offensive response, then this sends a new message to these groups that they have a limited window in which to work. Furthermore, if a nation responds to criminals backed by and hosted in another country, this will change the definition of risk for affected private organizations. The question becomes who is and isn't ready to participate in this new theater. If a nation engages in offensive hack-back operations, then to what degree should they defend private companies as well? which is arguably more valuable. The Washington Post summarizes three likely alternative explanations. First, the Kremlin bent under U.S. pressure and forced our evil to close up shop. Second, 
U.S. officials tired of waiting for Kremlin cooperation and launched a cyber operation that took our evil offline. And third, our evil's operators were feeling the heat and decided to lay low for a while. Dmitry Alperovich, chairman of the Silverado Policy Accelerator and well-known as the co-founder and former CTO of CrowdStrike, tweeted his own three suggestions. One, our evil decided to take a summer break or even rebrand themselves entirely like they did in 2019. Two, they got pressured by Russian government to go quiet, at least for a bit. And three, with the tip of his virtual hat to Domain Tools Joe Slowick, he suggests their intern screwed up DNS. On that third possibility, Alperovich and Slowick are surely funnin, but the possibility of IT problems can't be ruled out entirely. As Recorded Futures' Alan Liska told MIT Technology Review, the bulletproof hosting services criminals tend to use are often dodgy and unreliable, and sites do drop on and off. But in this case, that's unlikely, since all things are evil took it on the lam simultaneously. Liska said, quote, Ransomware sites are hosted by bulletproof hosting, and they're flaky. They all go up and down, but they never all go up and down at the exact same time. In his Twitter feed, Alperovich also commented that our evil's disappearance didn't look either like a U.S. cyber command operation or a takedown by non-Russian law enforcement agencies, quote, given that domains were not fully seized, as would be standard practice, end quote. Our evil's operators may simply be rebranding, as they are generally believed to have done in 2019, when our evil appeared shortly after Gandcrab announced that it was disbanding. Perhaps the operators will reform under a new name. If they just watched Black Widow, maybe they'll pick Red Room as their new name. It's worth noting that pressure by the Russian government is consistent with both retirement and rebranding. Privateers take guidance, after all. Taken down, on vacation, in custody, or just regrouping, the organizations who represent ransomware gangs' potential pool of victims would be unwise to let their guard down. Neil Jones, cybersecurity evangelist at Ignite, wrote us to say that, quote, when malware infrastructure goes offline, even temporarily, that's obviously good news for businesses. However, I would encourage organizations not to let their guards down and to continue with the proven detection and mitigation strategies that have gotten them through the recent ransomware crisis. Realistically, new ransomware infrastructure can be brought online quickly, so we all need to remain vigilant. While it's too early to determine the cause of the site's outages, continual steps must be taken to thwart ransomware groups, and the public and private sectors must come together at the highest levels to challenge multi-million dollar cybercriminal gangs. End quote. So, criminal infrastructure might be flaky and unreliable, but it's not difficult to stand up. Let the defenders beware. And finally, Imperva reports that the Euro 2021 tournament was accompanied by a flood of bot traffic across European sports and gambling sites. Italy took the Football Cup home, by the way, if the bots haven't already told you so. It's time to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor, Recorded Future. If you haven't already done so, take a look at Recorded Future's Cyber Daily. We look at it, the CyberWire staff subscribes and consults it daily. The web is rich with indicators and warnings, but it's nearly impossible to collect them by eyeballing the internet yourself, no matter how many analysts you might have on staff, and we're betting that however many you have, you haven't got enough. Recorded Future does the hard work for you by automatically collecting and organizing the entire web to identify new vulnerabilities and emerging threat indicators. Sign up for the Cyber Daily email to get the top trending technical indicators crossing the web. Cyber news, targeted industries, threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, malware, and suspicious IP addresses. Subscribe today and stay ahead of the cyber attacks. Go to recordedfuture.com slash cyberwire to subscribe for free threat intelligence updates from Recorded Future. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. Nico Van Summeren is Chief Technology Officer at Absolute Software, an endpoint security and data risk management firm. Using telemetry data gathered from the more than 13,000 endpoints they have deployed worldwide, they put together the latest version of their endpoint risk report. 
Well, of course, it goes without saying that uh, COVID has changed a number of things for a lot of our customers, particularly around the extent to which people are working away from head office. And so, as you might expect, we've seen an increase in the deployment of various of the controls that you would expect as people were sent home, VPN software and the like. But what we also saw was a continuation of a number of trends that we'd been seeing for a few years around the time it takes for risks at the endpoints to actually get addressed, around the amount of sensitive data being stored at those endpoints, about the complexity of the sets of security controls that happen at those endpoints. So we've seen trends about the number of vulnerabilities that are existing at the endpoints and how long they go unaddressed. We've seen trends around the amount of sensitive data being stored at those endpoints and generally about the, the decay of those controls at the endpoints. As you get increased complexity at the endpoint, you often find that uh, the controls fight with each other. And so you tend to get what we call decay of the security at the endpoint as those increasingly complex endpoints and the sets of tools that you've installed fight with each other and often switch each other off. Is this a a situation with diminishing returns where too much of a good thing might fight against us? Oh, yes. It's actually not merely diminishing returns, but we actually see that at certain stages you get a start to get a negative return. This increased complexity at the endpoint means that Not only are you adding more things to manage, but because those clients often fight with each other, we actually see that there's lower levels of compliance for some types of tool when you have other types of tool installed, reaching the point where as you add more complexity to the endpoint, you actually increase your risk rather than reducing your risk. So in terms of of the the information that you've gathered here, what are the take-homes? What are are the recommendations for organizations going forward? Well, I think that there are two things. And one of the things I only touched lightly on earlier was the level of unaddressed vulnerabilities and the delay in patching. Now, not wanting to sound like a stuck record, but getting faster at patching your systems is a really good thing because we're seeing, we saw a slight improvement over last year down to 80 days instead of 95 days was the average length of of out-of-dateness of Windows installations. But we're still seeing 40% of Windows 10 machines having over a thousand known vulnerabilities, which is a staggering number. So we do need to get better at patching, but we also need to make sure that we rationalize the set of endpoint controls to reduce that complexity. I think that moving towards more of a sort of zero trust model and trying to keep data in uh, highly managed cloud services rather than allowing the sensitive uh, data to end up on the endpoints is, is something that you can do to reduce that endpoint risk. And then we also see that some of the management tools that people expect to rely on themselves need managing. So one of the key things we noticed this year was that SCCM, actually Microsoft now call it, I think, MSCM or something. They, they changed its name, MES. <laughs> anyway, the, the thing, the, the, the endpoint agent formerly known as uh, uh, SCCM, even that built-in tool requires regular maintenance and reinstallation or or reconfiguration. We're seeing that within a 90-day period, upwards of a quarter of those endpoints actually need maintenance. So having insights into the state and health of those endpoints and all of the various different controls you install on there is crucial to maintaining your security posture. Now, you can have the best intentions to roll a set of controls, But if they don't stay in good condition, then you're not getting the value from all of those products that you've purchased. And so being able to have that insight and and stay healthy by keeping an eye on everything is crucial to, to maintaining this posture. That's Nico Van Summeren from Absolute Software.
And now, a word from our sponsor, Know Before. There's a reason more than half of today's ransomware victims end up paying the ransom. Cyber criminals have become thoughtful, taking time to maximize your organization's potential damage and their payoffs. After achieving root access, the bad guys explore your network, reading email, finding data troves, and once they know you, they craft a plan to cause the most panic, pain, and operational disruption. Ransomware has gone nuclear. The folks at Know Before have an upcoming webinar that'll get you up to speed on ransomware. In this webinar, you'll find out why data backups, even offline backups, won't save you, why ransomware isn't your real problem, and how your end users can become your best last line of defense. Go to knowbefore.com slash ransom to learn more about the webinar. That's K-N-O-W-B-E numeral four dot com slash R-A-N-S-O-M. And we thank Know Before for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Joe Kerrigan. He's from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute and also my co-host over on the Hacking Humans podcast. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. Uh, A a Twitter thread came by that caught my eye and really hits on some of the things that you and I talk about a lot over on Hacking Humans. Yes. This is from a gentleman named Chris Lacey. Uh, He's at Chris M. Lacey on uh, Twitter, evidently a developer. Uh, I believe he's uh, from Australia, Mm -hmm. seems to be. Uh, Develops a product called Action Launcher for Android. And Chris uh, posted this thread. He said, I just received a two-factor authentication SMS from Google that included an ad. Google's own messages SMS app flagged it as spam. And he says, what a shameful money grab. And he had a screen capture here, and it says, it has, here is your Google verification code, right? The kind of thing. It starts with the G, just like you'd expect. Anything, yeah, you'd expect from Google. And then there's an ad. It says, keep the hackers at bay. Get a VPN today. And it has a link. Yeah. Uh, so Chris goes down the path of wondering, is who, who put this ad on my SMS verification message? Was it Google? And some Googlers uh, chimed in and said, no, it wasn't us. We, right. don't, we don't do that. In fact, they're also very happy that their, uh, that their messenger app flagged it as spam. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> they, were, they were pleased to see that part of the app was working. Right, right. Uh, but it turns out that whoever... Uh, Chris's provider is the carrier, right? Was appending his SMS verification message with an ad, right? Now the fact that this ad is seems to be associated with security, right? Makes me think that in some way they're analyzing the content of the SMS message that he got, or they could be analyzing the the sending number of the SMS message, yep, right? Absolutely. Say, this is the number that Google uses to send their uh, their multi factor authentication codes out. Absolutely. Anytime you see that, just add this to the end, add, put an ad at the end of the text message. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Let me, let me tell you how I feel. Okay. And then I want to get your take on this. <laughs> I think everybody knows I, what my take is. I think I, I'm with, I think, I think I'm with Chris here. That this stinks to high heaven. Yeah. <laughs> it does stink to high heaven. Okay. What do you think about this, I, Joe? I, I'm with you and Chris, and I'm thinking somebody, it, whatever government level should be looking into this. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, an SMS, is you pay for that service. Right. Right. First off, that's one of the things I object to. This is a, pay, a, a service I pay for. Yeah. Do you remember years ago when we used to have to pay per message? Yes. Right? Yes. 10 cents per message for right. what was essentially just a, 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 you know, a milliseconds long use of the network. We had to pay 10 cents. Now yeah. we don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. Because the market forces have made it unlimited texting. Right. Um, but there's still the, this carrier is still trying to capitalize on getting a text message by selling ads on a text message that I that Chris pays for. Right. <laughs> that in and of itself infuriates me. Yeah. Or the second thing I don't like about this is what kind of vetting process do you do for these ads? Mm-hmm. Do you just sell them to anybody? Right. 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 Who knows where that link goes? Right. There's a link That's there. That's a, a shortened link. Yeah. Right. With yeah. an mr5.co with some. It, that, that is obviously some shortened link or right. link shortening service that you yeah. don't know where that goes. No. Uh, what due diligence is the carrier doing here? Yeah. I want to know that. Uh, sh- second off, should the carrier even be doing this? 
should there be some kind of regulation that says you cannot interfere with this in, in this right, way? Right. No, I, 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 here's the other thing that gets me about this is that this can erode your trust right. in your verification process. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And so on the one hand, that's terrible. I suppose if there is an upside to that, maybe we should be eroding trust in SMS as a multi-factor authentication method, right? Yeah, it's, it's not the best <laughs> multi-factor authentication method. Actually, and Chris talks about that. He says, to address the most common comments, yeah. one, I'm aware SMS is unencrypted and a poor choice for multi-factor authentication. Right, right. He, yeah, he seems sort of <laughs> exasperated by right, that. Right, because yeah. I, I know uh, thousands yeah. of people went, you shouldn't be using <laughs> right. the SMS for your two-factor, right, right. right? And he says, as an older account, and he was just logging into it again, yeah. I'm sure he now has gotten it set up with some kind of YubiKey or something right. uh, to help him secure this, but um, or some universal two-factor device. Yeah. Uh, it, it's... Uh, he he doesn't he does say he's not going to tell you who his carrier is for security reasons, which I think is probably wise. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to know who it is, but I'm not going to ask him right. um, <laughs> because I think his concern is valid. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, if this were my carrier, they wouldn't be my carrier for long. Right. They, they'd be receiving <laughs> a phone call from me. Right. right. Very quickly. Right. <laughs> um, one of the one of the final things comes from Mark Rishnu, who apparently works at Google. Yeah. And it says to close the loop, these are not Google ads. And we do not condone this practice. Yeah. We are working with wireless carriers to understand why this happened and to ensure, ensure that it doesn't happen again. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you know, you can see why this got my dander up, right? Yeah. Yeah. It <laughs> irritates me, Dave. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate uh, Chris sharing it here. I think this is good good information to know that this sort of thing is out there. And uh, Agreed. boy, the carriers... Uh, I, I I agree with you. This I, there, when I rule the world, <laughs> right. this, this, there won't be this kind of thing. Joe. The hammer of justice you. will come down upon these carriers. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, Joe Kerrigan, thanks for joining. It's us. my pleasure, Dave. Funding for this CyberWire podcast is made possible by Privacy.com. Protect your identity and banking information online by using Privacy's virtual cards instead of your real ones. Sign up for free and get $5 towards any purchase online at privacy.com slash cyberwire. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Peru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Tim Nodar, Joe Carrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now, a word from our sponsor, Verizon. Mitigate the risks and realize the benefits of digital transformation with the help of Verizon, a leader in cybersecurity managed and professional services for nearly two decades. From secure cloud computing solutions to advanced detection and response capabilities, Verizon helps secure data, networks, and infrastructure of many of the world's best-known organizations. Their annual Data Breach Investigations Report is considered the gold standard of cybercrime research. And Verizon's leadership in network, wireless, and IoT connectivity makes it uniquely capable of protecting the ever-expanding attack surface. Let Verizon help you optimize your defenses and achieve the maximum return on your security investments. Learn more at verizonenterprise.com slash products slash security.